Welcome back to Think Tech. This is View from the North. I'm Jay Fidel, and I am joined by Dr. Ken Rogers, uh, who is in British Columbia. Uh, we're going to talk today about, about the real condition of the American economy. And among other things, Ken has studied economics and finance, and he will help us understand what the real deal is in the U.S. and how much of what Trump and his acolytes are saying is true or not true about that. Welcome to the show, Ken. We uh, certainly feel better about our political outlook than yours. Uh, and uh, in Canada, people look at the economy somewhat the same way as people in the U.S. look at the economy. You know, what has happened over the last five years and how do people feel about it? Well, in the U.S., it seems that the Trump side is pushing that, uh, you know, the economy sucks and everything's terrible and and Biden's to blame and Trump's the kind of guy that could fix anything, especially the economy. Um, you know, and then they throw in a bunch of lies to to sort of justify a bunch of that thinking. However, in reality, if you sit with the average citizen, most people own single family homes or condos. Virtually all mortgages have five year terms. So over the last five years, a huge number of people post COVID have have had to have their mortgage renewed. Well, when you change the interest rate from two or three percent to you know five or six percent or seven percent, depending what city and you're in, uh, the monthly payment is just a jolt, and that shows up every month. It it really has decimated the you know budget of many many people when interest rates were low everybody got excited and they to a great extent increased their their size of their housing you know and then the minute interest rate changed that puts an extra choke on it it's not only you know that they have a mortgage at a higher rate but they got a bigger mortgage at a higher rate now secondly it's really obvious for anybody that goes to the supermarket that the prices are much higher than you remember they were. But your memory isn't just two months ago, or has the price changed so much in the last three months or two months, or is the rate of increase declined? You just think about it as what was it two or three years ago, and holy smokes, it's no wonder I got no money left. So you've got some key factors that a a voter in whether in Canada or the U.S. would have a front of mind is how is the economy in their mind? Well, that's sitting at their kitchen table looking at their budget, and for an awful lot of people, they say it sure looks crappy, like it does not feel really nice. Now that's a very, very short term look. You know, if you're sitting with, uh, you know, what uh, did countries do to resolve the uh, COVID crisis? And the COVID crisis also created some ridiculous supply chain issues. And so that the, you know, resulting supply chain issues really were the key to why inflation really took off. You could also blame to some again, some extent the governments of the world that, you know, spent a lot of money trying to, you know, keep everybody alive and keep everybody afloat with the COVID shutdowns, you know, their fiscal policy. Um, <clears throat> however, when you really stand back and look at who did the best, you know, who um, did the best economic management, you know, and really the United States is, is far ahead of anybody else in the world in terms of, of the fiscal management that was done, you know, to um, <clears throat> in the last five years. You've got to take in the context of the world you know, the world's economy 
has a gross domestic product this year that's estimated about $106 trillion. Well, the United States is a little over $28 trillion of that, you know, and both China and the EU are about, you know, $18 trillion. Well, when you add those three together, the EU, excluding Britain, you know, the EU... China and the United States, you got 60% of the gross domestic product of the world. And we haven't counted, you know, the of the 10 biggest economies in the world, you know, the United Kingdom, Japan and Canada are in that mix. <laughs> and they're not even included in those numbers. So, so most of the rest of the world really doesn't have much of an economy. You know, you can take a country like India is the most populous country in the world, and its its gross domestic product is about the say a little bit bigger than um, than the United Kingdom, but but about the same or a bit smaller than Japan. You know, in a few years, India will be the third biggest economy in the world, but you know, it's growing at not a bad rate, but it's very poor in terms of. Um, the public view, you know, would be different than a professional economist's view of how did everybody perform. You know, the public was looking at the grocery bill and the increased mortgage payments, you know, where an economist is looking at, um, you know, who did the best to come out of COVID and what is the growth rate now and what is the unemployment rate now and what's the outlook and what's inflation now well in the u.s you know the u.s economy is performed better than any of the major countries in the world um in the last you know post covid and coming out of covid the u.s had a major advantage because the united states dollar is the reserve currency um, the United States was able to run a bigger deficit than anybody else without worrying too much about it. Uh, the Europeans were pretty shy about about a lot of public spending. Canada and Australia, you know, followed uh, pretty close to the same pattern as the U.S., but because they're not reserve currencies, they had to rein in a little bit. If you compare European Union with the United States, in the United States, um, basically the same as Canada and Australia, their main COVID item was to stick, get money in the pockets of the public so that they could stay afloat and, and small businesses could stay afloat. And so the public, you know, spent. And the, the fact that they were spending kept the businesses operating. Well, then the European unions, their lesser quantity of public spending, um, all went, or most of it went for infrastructure. Now, the infrastructure was badly needed, wonderful long-term game plan, but the public was sucking air, so they weren't spending, so all of their businesses were hurting. So when you come out of COVID, they're they're badly limping in the first place. They're limping along and and uh, not doing well. And the inflation in Europe has been worse than it has been in in North America or 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 South America. Uh, well, South America is a bit of an exception. Some of those, <laughs> like Argentina, when I said that, I just thought of Argentina and its inflation is going past the moon. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, uh, you know, I believe that the the U.S. had some major advantage with the COVID spending was to put money in the hands of the public, whereas um, <clears throat> post-COVID, you know, the infrastructure bill and the chips bill just focus directly on getting major capital investment by businesses. And so, you know, those are the things that increase the GDP per capita. Like, what is your standard of living? 
Canada and Europe are basically dealing with a slight, you know, almost declines in per capita income. You know, that like Canada, Australia, and Europe and the U.S. are all suffering from tons of immigration, you know, people from poor countries wanting to come to to live in the rich place. The responses are different. Uh, you know, Canada is probably more so than, or definitely more so than the U.S. or Australia has, has a ridiculous number of immigrants. You know, and if you just have a jolting increase in the population um, and you haven't in- expanded your economy a- as fast, you know, your average income per person will go down statistically. You know, the guy with the job is still okay, but, you know, the new jobs are not necessarily as good. This big issue. Um, so Trump has been um, convicted on 34 counts, felony counts. Um, in the Stormy Daniels uh, hush money case. And right after that happened, he did everything he could to change the subject. And, uh, you know, we don't have the time to go through all the things he has done in the past, what, two weeks to change the subject. One week to change the subject. Um, One of the things that he has done uh, and his acolytes have joined him in is to criticize Biden's economy. To say that, um, and he, this is a thread he's he's been on before, is that he um, fixed the economy during his term. Biden has not fixed the economy during his term. The economy is in terrible shape right now. Trump can fix it. The first question is, um, exactly how bad is the economy or good is the economy under Biden? Uh, how bad or good was the economy? Did Did the national government's moves regarding the economy, how how good or bad were they during the Trump administration? Um, and how do you measure that? What are the metrics that really count? I know that a price of a quart of milk is re- relevant and the price of a, a mortgage, uh, which has increased in monthly payments is relevant. But the bottom line is, um, are we better off now? I hate to ask this question. This is the Ronald Reagan question. Are we, are, we, are we better off now than we were, um, you know, three or four years ago? Um, and how and how can you tell? Huge credibility question, because the, the two sides of this equation are diametrically opposed. Biden is saying, I've done a good job. Look, look at the results of my work on the economy. And Trump is saying, no, you haven't. You did a terrible job. The economy is in, in you know, in, in trouble. And I did a much better job. So I really wanted to discuss with you, you know, how you can, how either of them can make these statements on the basis of what metrics, and uh, who who is telling more of the truth than the other. Are we better off? Good question. And one of the items is depending on on who the person is. Trump was better, and the next person, Biden, was better. Now I think of Trump, the Trump era. Uh, ending with uh, him uh, helpless uh, on TV, so helpless to solve the COVID mess, he's suggesting everybody drink bleach. I don't know if you remember that. I mean, but it... it well, of course, it of course, just... everybody remembers that. And they remember, too, the fact that a million people died while he was fiddling. Well, because he didn't do even anything to solve the health problem. And... You know, the, the kind of thing, you know, that the Democrats are missing is pushing what was the end of the Trump era all about? You know, how pathetically bad were, were they? If you're a, a very wealthy person in the United States, you are much better off now than you were five years ago, and your outlook looks terrific. And that goes to, you know, most professionals like you know, doctors, dentists, lawyers, um, that type of person. And then everybody that's richer than that, what I'd call the very rich, uh, you know, people that own businesses, major holdings of any stocks. When you get down to the the core of the public, uh, those who do not have a mortgage at a high 
rate of interest. You know, most seniors have their house clear title by now, or, you know, people that are over 50-ish or so, um, or over 60, let's say. Um, and so they're, they're better off in the sense of not having that mortgage shock, but they still are aware that groceries cost a lot more. Everything costs a lot more. Go to a restaurant and you choke at the at the prices. But when you really take a an an economist's viewpoint and put a little longer ter term range into your thinking, the United States um, Biden has performed fantastically compared to anybody else in the world, and particularly compared to the whole Trump era. Um, you know, when Trump took office, the economy had some momentum. When he left office, it was dead as a doornail um, in terms of every matter. And, and the inflation was and COVID were the problems that Biden inherited. He fixed the COVID crisis, um, you know, led the world in that solving, you know, where, you know, Trump just said all Americans can just die, you know, you shouldn't have, you know, vaccines <laughs> and, and good common sense health items. Post-COVID, the, the major legislation that, that Biden was able to get through, even though, you know, he had uh, an uphill fight with a majority of Republicans in the House, you know, the CHIPS Act and the and the infrastructure stuff, the you know, and his expenditures during COVID to get out of COVID to simply put money in the hands of the public has, um, you know, encouraged businesses to invest at such a scale that the U.S. has extremely low unemployment. The inflation is still around but it's around in the rest of the world at a push at a higher push rate than it is in the U S um, you know, but it's down significantly. Um, so that's a, a major improvement. And um, you know, the job market is, is really strong in the U S in the month of um, gee, what, May, I guess um, there were 360,000 jobs added, you know, to the economy. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, but that might be, you know, the, still, you know, the couple that, uh, you know, both are working and, and, you know, they're 40 years old and they got a big fat mortgage. They ju they expanded their house just before COVID hit because the interest rates were so low. You know, they're still sucking air, though, <laughs> you know, because the, the high, the more you just can't overestimate the importance of, of mortgage payments to, you know, that uh, middle income couples that are, that are, you know, less than 60 years old. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about this. You know, we have seen little mm, threats popping up in the newspaper about chicken flu. Um, and there was a live chicken flu case in Mexico a couple of days ago. Um, and I guess it comes from Asia. Um, there have been, and I consider these slightly ridiculous, uh, re-examinations, mostly by the Republicans, uh, into uh, the origins of COVID in the first place years ago. Um, there have been um, lots of news stories from the medical profession um, about how COVID is re-emerging now. Maybe another variant, who knows what it is. And there have been in increase in a number of cases. In, in major cities in the U.S. And now remember that one of the culture points that Trump created um, during, during the entire span of COVID was he somehow got people to reject COVID and to reject um, being vaccinated um, and to, I guess, to, 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 to take your best chance and die over it. And a lot of people did. They followed him. <laughs> And that culture still exists. We have a pandemic now. I think that's going to reemerge. And there's going to be people who say, oh, no, 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 I'm not taking any vaccine. My kids, my, my family, they're not going to take any vaccine. 
because I was convinced by Trump, but mm, uh, four or five years ago, that it was bad to take a vaccine. So I'm I'm with him. I follow Trump and his advice. Better now, to drink bleach than to, than it is to have a vaccine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, well, that anti-vax uh, attitude has uh, definitely spread from the U.S. to Canada. I don't know if that's the case in in Europe or or Australia or other civilized places. It's astonishing in Canada how you have a, you know, in the rest of the world as well, uh, diseases that that were dead and gone, like measles, you know, are coming back. And, you know, and if you think of, you know, when we were children, everybody had measles or when I was a child, everybody had measles. And, and you, you know, it was a long time after that they invented vaccination for it but you know nowadays people are getting shingles because they had measles as a kid <laughs> you know that it doesn't fully go away all of this can come back but what i'm thinking is at some point either now in the fall in the five months before the election uh, we're going to see covid or some variant of covid raise its ugly head and we're going to see pushback by by the trumpers Saying, "Oh no, we're we're not we're not going to do uh, vaccines and the like," uh, and or if he is either elected or he takes power in some other way um, in uh, twenty twenty five, uh, we're going to see him do the same playbook: um, discourage medical science, actually attack people like uh, Fauci, which they are doing now. Re Republicans and to to uh, incredible that they are attacking Fauci years after. Um, and if that happens, that is if we have another pandemic, either of COVID or a variant of COVID or chicken flu or you name it, uh, around the country, the world, um, Trump will do the same thing as before. It's just another reason to worry about a Trump administration next time around. I think it'll be a lot worse than, than you think even. In that, uh, you know, I, I believe, you know, the first types of actions that Trump will take, uh, and I think it's in that, you know, fat manual of, you know, Project 2025 or whatever they call their Bible for policies, but essentially um, his early priorities would be, number one, revenge, you know, go after all kinds of people. But most importantly, uh, the second one would be to obliterate the federal civil service. You know, and, and if you think of what would his rich friends, if he has any friends, uh, want to uh, want him to do, you know, or what could he do that they might cont continue to support him and, and contribute to him? And it would be, you know, you know, dismantle the tax department, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the the Fauci Empire, or you know everything to do with the you know the federal involvement in restricting you know what you know a uh, slaughterhouse can do to keep the hygiene up, etc. You know the last time they shipped the Department of Agriculture to Wobonko. Kansas or something, you know, to, you know, just obliterate that. Well, think of, do a worse job than uh, worse for the economy or worse for what's good for healthcare in particular, um, is just take what he did to the agricultural department and do it to all of the civil service. The DOJ is, is, uh, is the weapon that he will use for revenge. It, it, it won't be dismantled. It'll be front and center. It may be some method by which he can eliminate a whole bunch of judges. You know, whether he sixes his his, uh, his hit squad on them, like, uh, you know, Ingron and, <laughs> and Marchand and, and such, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, but sending uh, all his enemies to court with Eileen Cannon as the judge, uh, you know, <laughs> take her orders and 
implement whatever. I mean, that's a cynical Canadian look at the U.S. justice, but uh, but certainly that's how I see it. The important thing to me is I can't believe, and and none of my neighbors and people I talk to in Canada at various levels of of IQ and experience all feel, or virtually all of them think, you know, how can Americans not realize Trump can't put two sentences together without a lie, you know, seems to, you know, have, have lost any, you know, plausible skills that he did have. The Republicans like to pick on the idea that Biden is older than Trump. But if you're to listen to both of them speak for a while, you know, clearly uh, Biden is much <laughs> more on his feet or his mind is together better than Trump's. Well, looking at this this way, during Trump's administration, beginning with a, quote, Tax Reform Act of January 2017, which, um, you know, his Republican group in Congress passed without a single hearing, without any analysis or examination, to favor the 1% and essentially dump on the 99%. He didn't do anything to help the economy in his four-year term. Well, that he, one tax cut increased the deficit by such a degree that it was the major contributor to inflation. Not yes. the only, but it was a very major one, just as important as, as were the you know, supply disruptions and some of the COVID effects. It was just a ridiculous uh, thing for, a negative thing for the economy. Now Trump uh, threw himself and his acolytes and as a way to change the subject from the fact that he's a convicted felon, um, is attacking Biden. And the primary line of attack is that the economy is, is, not, is, is not as good under Biden as it was under Trump. Oh, and trying to make the parallel that uh, Biden's son's minor infractions make him the Biden family in the same category as the Trump Trump family. Yeah. And oh, and, and there's, there's a half a dozen other things. They're attacking and they're trying to impeach various officials and they're hassling uh, Merrick Garland for the DOJ. I mean, there's all these things to change the subject. They're occupying the media full tilt. So my, my question that comes to mind, I want to ask you is, if if Trump gets back into office and he repeats the policies and the, the playbook that he had before, including the playbook about, um, for example, um, you know, a disease and climate change, um, what happens to the economy then? Uh, what will we see happening? Can you give me a little analysis, assuming that he does what he did before? Where does the economy go? Most things that the government does take takes time to filter through and affect the economy. You know that uh, if he slashes a bunch of civil servants, you know they will simply be out looking for other kinds of jobs. There'd be almost no effect for somebody who's living in Washington State or Nevada. You know. Texas, they, you know, that what effect that have? It's hard to believe, as a Canadian, where I've lived in the United States for years, and I tend to think the average American is as smart as the average Canadian, and and so on. Is how Americans could be so stupid as to even put Trump in? You know, like I just don't see. Um, why he would be put in, but, you know, really in four years, he'll be able to do one ridiculous amount of damage and most importantly, make it impossible to get he and his friends out of office. He's old enough and and mentally limited enough that he may not last for four years, but... Um, <clears throat> You know, dictators have lasted for a long time. And, and I just, um, you know, if you're sitting in downtown Honolulu, you know, and you change the government in Washington, there's no change the next day. You know, and, you know, a month later, just because uh, 
you know, he fired Eric, uh, Garland and the, you know, beat up the uh, FBI and, you know, turned the Department of Justice to pick on all of his enemies, uh, you know. So far, when you're sitting in Seattle or San Francisco or Honolulu, you haven't seen anything change. Mm. You know, and how long does it take for a change to filter through to get there? You don't want to be on his special list, you know. It's out of the Mercado. I have a special list. Um, and, you know, there have been people in real history that have had special lists. You wouldn't want to be in his special list. But let me ask you, let's assume for a moment for this discussion that he uses the same playbook, that he spends all his time on vengeance, um, that he doesn't care about, um, you know, the, the common man. He only cares about the one percent. And he does the same kind of things that he did, you know, the corrupt things, ingratiate himself uh, as he did in the first four years. Let's assume that. What effect on Canada? Probably be pretty catastrophic. I mean, one of his uh, his old playbooks uh, was to you know make the United States a little more isolationist, have have fat tariffs and and play big bully with everybody you trade with. Um, well, Canada's you know largest trading partner by far is the United States, and Canada's. Um, exports equally far far higher percentage of the canadian gross domestic product than does that for the u.s the canadian economy would take a pretty big hit um if trump era continued for long i would expect that uh, that they would um they would covet uh, very much uh, uh the province of alberta uh, the half of the province of Saskatchewan, so you might as well take all of it, you know, the, the side that's closest to Alberta and the northeast part of British Columbia, um, you know, because that's all the phenomenal oil and gas that's, you know, got more reserves than the United States does in that area, you know, and that would give a nice connection to Alaska. I would think that, you know, like Canada would break up with push from Trump friends, you know, it's they wouldn't give a hoot about uh, Quebec. You know, it's French speaking, and even if Montreal is a nice place and Quebec City is even nicer, um, that, uh, you know, that's not their cup of tea. I think, um, you know, you'd end up with Canada being broken up um, with uh, caused by the U.S. coveting certain of uh, of our assets and and pushing differences between attitude of eastern canada versus western canada yeah it sounds like um, that sounds like trump it's transactional corruption which was the hallmark of his first term charles de gaulle you know when he came to canada and you know his leading his uh, parting comments were vive la quebec libre you know like trying to push quebec to separate from Canada so we could have a, a friendly French-speaking country in this hemisphere. Let me ask you to make a final summary remarks here about the subject. And the subject is, how bad is the U.S. economy right now? What are the metrics and factors that we should be looking at to make a true evaluation of it? Well, the first one is, what's the gross domestic product per person, you know, and it is, you know, the 10th or 11th highest in the world. Well, you've got um, some of the European countries like, like Norway that was gifted with a lot of oil and not much population, you know, has slightly higher. The U.S. has um, the largest economy in the world by far. Uh, it has, you know, the best um it has a better growth rate over the last five years than anybody else you know other than countries that are pulling up their socks from zero to something like india you know or china has an average growth rate that's higher than the u.s but they're sucking air for all kinds of financial things i think the u.s economy should get you know triple a marks for 
right now for what's been done uh, in the Biden era. You know, just the, you couldn't have done much better, you know, in all circumstances, given the supply chain disruptions, the COVID mess, the rest of the world sucking air, um, you know, wars all over the place, whether it's, you know, every, every second country in Africa, you know, <laughs> You know, even India, they're fighting with their, you know, the Sikhs and uh, China is, you know, sticking people in the in prison camps for cheap labor, you know, because they don't they, they don't toe the line for their central government thinking. So I think the U.S. economy is, has been really, really good. It's it's the jobs market is strong. The wages are going up. Um Inflation is down. The economy has expanded uh, faster than any other major civilized place. Um, I mean, why are people beating at the door to get into the United States? Mm -hmm.